that comes to the uh, definition of an angel. Messenger, right? Messenger. Akhtangalos in Greek means bearer of good news. Well, what's the good news? Christianity. For the Armenians, Akhtangalos was the historian who wrote the history of the Armenians called, called the history of the Armenians. And he is our source, our main source for our Armenians to meet first. It's called Akhtangalos. We have that in English, by the way. You don't have to be good up to be able to understand. Now, what did he say? He said that when Armenians became Christian, we acquired an identity that was in many ways different than what we had been before. Because before we had been what Zoroastrians or pagans, and now we changed our religion, we changed our identity. But some parts of our old identity still remain because you know what? We still spoke Armenian before we were Christian. So language really stayed the same, but also was changed under that. So one important aspect of identity is being a Christian. That's what we find in our accounts. What's the second story? Probably you've heard of Moses Oyevitz. But Mahayu, 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 he's the father of Armenian history. He also wrote in the fifth century. He wrote another work, it's the same name, but it's history of the Armenians. And what he gives us is where we trace our origins to. And, uh, well, who was the patriarch of all Armenians? Who was the first Armenian? Haim. That name Haim comes to us from Alpha, from Kodevats. That's where we get the name Haim. And what does he do? He wanted to tie the Armenian history to Christian history. So what did he do? He said Haim was a descendant of Noah. And therefore, Armenians are directly from Noah and directly from the Bible. Is that all he said? No. He said, look at the name I everyone. I, I. Well, Armenian. The name I actually means Armenians. So, in a way, that's the way we call ourselves, right? But no one else in the world calls us I. They call us Armenian. That name, Armenia, Armenian, came to us from Greek and in the 6th century. This is the second part then of our identity, is our national identity. Christian identity and a national identity as a unique people. Now what's the third one? Yemishen. All of you, I'm sure, have heard of Yemishen. You've heard of Vartat Mahatma When do we celebrate uh, the Battle of Havana? On the Thursday before the beginning of Lent. I study at the party of San Jorsi, the Vitore, Avarai, Avarazi, in the Nishik Vartan Mamikonia. But it's interesting to Nishik Vartan Mamikonia. Nishik, what are the Nishik Perez? I'm Bartan for for the main, the Haskanat, the Vartan, the Ober, the English, the Nelgaiats. What did Vartan represent? Very simple. Armenians would die for their Christianity. They would rather die than simply change their religion. And Yenishi writes about that. Of course, the hero is Vartan who lost his life. But what, what did he say? Remember uh, Vartan, uh, Yenishi's famous words uh -huh. in Armenian? Meaning that if you know why you were going to die, if you don't know why you were going to die, that's dead. But if you know why you have a purpose in dying, that's the immortality. Do we not still today recognize and celebrate Vartan Mikonia? So what did Yedishin, the third historian from the 5th century, he united the Armenian Christian identity with our culture and alphabet and made it a national thing. And after the 5th century, everyone, up until today, today's a little different. Today, 21st century is a little different. But if you talk to anyone in the world after the 5th century, what would they say in Armenia? They would say they're Christian, with their unique alphabet, their own history, their own... It's, everything is there. And it all comes because it was related to us in the 5th century. So isn't literature important to us to understand it, I guess, who we are? How would you know who you are if you didn't know who your parents, grandparents, relatives, where you came from? We all have a context, we all have a place we came from, and that helps to place us in that. Now let's jump ahead. 
This is a map that's kind of hard to read, but you see the red line? That's the boundary between what was called the Ottoman Empire, Turkish, and at the time the Persian Empire, and later the Russian Empire. Many of you come from an area which is today called Armenia, but was for many hundreds of years part of Eastern Armenia. And then many of you others come from Western Armenia. Your, your ancestors came from Bob, Yuka, Yet, Sebastian, Adil, and the Ottoman Where do we get that term, Adil, and the We get it because Armenians in the western part of Western Armenia was in the Turkish Empire. Now, what does that mean to live in an empire like the Turkish Empire? And the big question is for 400 years, 400 years, and that's twice the age of the United States. The Armenians were still able to speak the Armenian. Why was that possible? How, how was it that Armenians could say Armenian? Because they made a foreign rule under Muslim leadership, under Turkish rule. Why did, they, why did they all just convert? Because they had the, the basis of their identity already set in the history that we talked about, right? And then what do we have? The church. I don't have enough time to talk about it, but the church is a major factor in maintaining identity. Second, the literature and the history, the books. Third, education. I don't think there's probably an Armenian in this room or not that doesn't value education. Right? You want your children to be educated. Well, that's always been very important. The school was next to the church, the part of the church. Third, I said to you how other people look at you, right? When you first look at the Armenians, I say, call them a Tibet. And many Tibet, the Armenian Tibet, the nation was recognized as a separate Armenian entity. If you wanted to get married in the Ottoman Empire as an Armenian, you didn't go to the government, you go to the get your license, went to the church. And that helps to maintain our identity, doesn't it? Because we maintain within that group. Which was the Armenian. We let the same thing happen in the Persians, later for uh, with the Russians. And finally, we still have Nahars and also merchants who took on the ownership role. So it wasn't as if only Armenians were, were uh, without any leaders in this period. But these are some only of the, of the factors which help to understand us, we understand as Armenian. Now let's talk about writers. And this is where we'll kind of come to the last point that I'll make today. Uh, how many of you have I've heard of Tajo Raise your hand if you've heard of It's the name of the biggest street in Armenia, isn't it? Abonia Polos Oboda, Abonia Oboda. There's a city in Armenia called Abonia. He was a 19th century writer, 1809 to 1848. He wrote a very important work called Bergayas Armenia. Arachin, Arachin Bedbed, Hayeno, Yev, Moshe. Writes Arti He is the establisher of modern Eastern Armenian history book in the language of people spoke. Bed, uh, the wounds, right? The wounds of Armenia. And he portrayed the Armenians again, what were Armenian folks not weren't they? If the Persians fought the Turks, where are they going to fight? Right in the middle, right? Right in the middle of Armenia. So his bed, Tajadurabunia's bed, was the feeling that the Armenians had been abandoned. Let's take a look at one of his quotes. It's small, but I'm just going to read a couple of parts to it. He says, My beloved nation, my blessed forefathers, for 20 or 30 years, my heart has been a fire, burning day and night. My eyes have been struck with grief and sorrow by brothers. I wish I could only express my desires to hope. He was burning up because he saw the condition of the Armenians. So, what's the solution for him? He says it down here. He says, I would think of all those places where my people walk and still do, even in the stones, the field, the desert, the church, the home, and would not compel me to be pulled out by heart. In other words, he felt the suffering of the Armenians on his own soul. And that's what the book is all about. Now, that helps to understand the identity. Look at Mikhail Kalmanya. He 
You know that one guy was famous, but I mean, he's poet, he's a great But he was a poet. You can see in red, that's the one word I have that never passed up to someone. Mikhail Dalbanya lived in Russian Armenia, but he still saw the same thing that Apovian saw, which was that the Armenians needed their freedom, their liberty. This helped to shape an entire generation. Uh, we call the Western Armenian Zantok, I would die, uh, I, I would have Zantok the last thing ever found in the 19th century. And this is just Bedros Turian, was the first major Western Armenian writer. Bedros Turian, the book, and Sandarian, and the And he actually only died at the age of 20, Bedros Turian. He's a romantic poet. But he established, you know, romanticism being not that he fell in love, but he was in love, he could never get married. Died at 21 years old from tuberculosis. You know, this was the thing Armenians died young. But what did he do? He wrote ideas in it that shaped our modern concept of identity. I'm going over this a little quickly, but the names you need to remember are things you need to know. And today we're going to talk about two major writers because I wrote books on them. The first is Bisak Metsanis. Uh, how many of you have heard of Bisak Metsanis? Say two or three people, good, four people. Isak Mezarez uh, is a famous writer. Look how old he was. Only 22 years old, he also succumbed to tuberculosis. But he lived in a place called King Gatun Akiu, near Kakhet. And he became one of the great lyric poets of Armenian literature. And his work is considered to be the most beautiful of Armenian poetry in the 19th century. And uh, just last year, in 2021, the Armenian Studies Program published a complete translation of all of his poems from Armenian English. So, go, and it's face to face with the Armenian. So, you can, you can read the Armenian and also see the English. And let's just take a look. I'm not going to read these because they're longer, but uh, this is sort of dedicated to the new year. It's a very romantic poem. You know, he lived in the countryside. So, everything he wrote about was very beautiful. But in this poem called Fragments, which is number 191, he used the word to talk about fatherland. This word was banned in Turkey. You couldn't talk about fatherland because the Armenians didn't have a fatherland for the Turks. That was certain, but the Armenians, I didn't. And Bisak Mezahen wrote also about his people's struggles with the Ottomans. Uh, that's very brief. I'd like you to take a look at the book, even if you don't know first, or maybe not take a look at the poems. Uh, Dr. James Russell, who translated it, also gives an introduction, a beautiful introduction, to the whole context. And for every poem, each poem, he gives an explanation. So he, it's a very good book to take a look at. Now, also in 1908, some of you know about the Turkish Revolution that took place. Sultan al Hamid was kicked out. The Committee of Union and Progress in the Parliament, everyone thought everything was going to be great, right? It didn't turn out that way. But it was, again, the Zako. If I saw the mayor of Badia Baruja, the people saw the movements of Badia Baruja, 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 the movements of Badia I All of these great writers of Armenian literature were killed in the genocide. But after the genocide, we have a great Armenian writer by the name of Sabet Veseya. Today I brought one of her books, meaning we have one of her books that we translated into the English, short stories. Why is Sabel the same so important? Because we haven't talked about women in that way. We talked about all the writers that they were men, but they were women writers. Sabel the same was going to be arrested the night on April 23rd, but she fortunately was in the city and escaped. She has a wonderfully interesting life. She lived in Paris. She went back to Armenia, and unfortunately, Soviet Armenia. And unfortunately, she was killed probably by the Soviet authorities for being too nationalist. Two nationalists. But why is her work so important for Armenian identity? Because, because she was an author of humanitarian and an activist. In 1909, she wrote a 
what a wonderful book about the Adalai chapter. Uh, she went to Adala after the 1909 massacres and was, uh, was there to witness it and wrote a book about it. This is very small, you won't be able to see it. Our new book has three short stories about not Armenian women, but about Turkish women. But it's about what was happening to Armenians also. She is a, she is a pioneer in, in the field of what we call today you know, feminism, or the idea that women have an equal role to play in society. Uh, she is a great writer. She is a great writer. And if you have a chance, it's a small book, but a very interesting book on Sabel Lizayan, published by our press uh, in the European Studies Program. So that's, that's my major part of my talk. The last thing is I'm just going to show you some of the books that we have, and then uh, I'll conclude. So I mentioned to you that since 2009, so that's been what, almost 13 years ago, we published our first book. It was a book about William Savoy. Then we published another book, and then this book is a really interesting book. Some of you have heard of Diana Nervo-Vanessa. She just passed away a few years ago. She was a great American Indian poet, poetess. We took her uh, translations of all of the Armenian poets and published them. A fourth book was the David of Sassoon book that I had to be contribution. Great story of Sassoon's family. Then Bahan Mikhea, one of the great poets we were talking about. So what's my choice of books? It's generally literature, but a little bit of history. It's the Armenian literature in France by people of Bolivia. Western Armenian in the 21st century. I want to bring your special attention because I brought uh, quite a few of these books. I think this is one of my favorite books. It's by a man called Bedros Kelchik. Have you heard of his name before, Bedros Kelchik? He was the first Armenian to live in Minnesota, and his relatives still live there. He opened up a carpet store eventually, but he was a refugee from the Armenian massacres. And he wrote short stories about the Armenian community in the 1920s and 1930s. There's 28 short stories, originally in Armenian, now in English, they're funny, but they are the same story that I bet everyone could tell about their experience as an immigrant. Do you think it's any different for an Italian immigrant than an Armenian immigrant when you first come to America? Some of you are first generation Americans. You would find a lot that you would find very similar to that. It's a really wonderful book. We also have another book uh, that was done on a conference uh, called Armenians and Kurds, a book on the First Republic of Armenia. That's our 10th volume. Are any of you from Musada? Are any of you uh, Musada Sikhs? No? Yes, okay. And Mano is uh, from that area. This is the definitive history in English of the story of how the Armenians of Musada defended themselves in 1915. It has more than 100 original pictures never before seen of the story of how they were rescued. Uh, All that story is told here by Dr. Bhagavan Shivas. The Visa Petra in this volume I mentioned. And then our two latest books, 13 and 14, uh, is the Zaba de Sanko. You know, you've heard of the Committee of Union Progress. They were responsible for the Armenian massacres, the genocide. Uh, we've written a book uh, about that party, about the history of that party. If you're interested, it's more of a uh, sort of a work that you, you have to have an interest in these people, but it's fascinating, fascinating. So, uh, thank you very much for your attention. That was just a sort of brief overview of uh, the story of Armenians and their identity. I ended with just two or three writers, but uh, for those of you that are familiar with the hundreds of writers, we know about our identity through reading the stories of our writers and historians. So, thank you very much for your attention, Shara Julian.